So in section 2.8, related rates, we're going to investigate a few more applications of derivatives. Um, and what we're looking at is uh, the, the idea of related rates. I'm going to underline that or maybe, maybe highlight rates. Usually that gives me an idea that I'm going to be using derivatives in some form or another. And when we talk about rates, uh, for this section, uh, all variables will be considered functions of time. So when you're a function of time, a lot of times you, you will see the, the function notation where instead of x we're using t. Uh, we talked about the position function, that's a function of time. But the other variables in this section are moving in a sense of uh, relation with time. So the other variables you see, even though you don't see the function notation, we have to kind of think about it that there is another variable involved. So when you end up taking derivatives, you're taking them with respect to time. So this is where we run into um, a little bit of the um, concepts from implicit differentiation and the fact that we're applying the chain rule. Uh, kind of keep in mind, I'll try to show you in a concrete example, but if you were to take the derivative of your variable, if it's not clearly the t variable, then you'd have to add on a chain to, to look at the derivative with respect to time. So I cannot emphasize it enough, but when you do this, it helps set up the problem so you know what you're plugging in. So we'll play with this. Um, let's see, another issue with this section, I don't know if it's issue, but you wanna pay attention to, you're gonna be pulling from a lot of the mathematics that you've dealt with your, your entire life. So just because it, we haven't talked about it in this class, you may have to deal with um, stuff that you know from trig, um, we might have to look at maybe similar triangles, a little geometry there. Um, we have a lot of area volume formulas or sometimes the Pythagorean theorem comes up. Um, there's a lot of things you're pulling from, so just try to be careful and, and think about these. We'll be going over about four examples uh, for this lecture, but keep in mind it's impossible to go over every single type of example you'll ever see whenever it's a related rate problem. Um, I, my hope is I can just give you some experience so that when you see a problem that you don't have an exact example for, you'd be able to approach it uh, and, and end up solving it. So let's get started. Um, example one, we're looking at uh, the radius of a circle is increasing at a rate of five centimeters per minute. And right away, um, rate kind of pops up in my head. How fast, again, how fast rate is the area increasing when the radius is 10 centimeters. So it looks to be a non-threatening problem. There's not too many words to it, but I wanna break it down so that we can apply this technique to everything else. Um, a lot of times what I like to use when I'm dealing with these related rate problems, I like to use the uh, Leibniz notation um, it really helps me understand what I'm really dealing with. Uh, so let's talk about maybe listing what's given for ourselves. Not a bad idea to label that. So I always look for where the numbers are located. And the first number I see is five, uh, five centimeters per minute. And whenever I see a rate, remember, I'm kind of looking at a derivative. Not kind of, I am looking at a derivative. So um, if you're trying to get an idea of how this particular problem is, I know when every time they have a shape, let's, let's see if I can show off a little bit with shapes, maybe. Uh, let's see, I'm looking for a circle. Let's see if it lets me do it. Oh, look at that makes me so happy. Anyways, it's about the little things, right? So we have ourselves a circle and we kind of think about, well, they did mention the radius. 
So maybe it doesn't hurt to, you know, draw things to get your mind moving. So I know I might be dealing with R. And the way I see this, the radius is increasing at a rate of five centimeters per minute. So what that's supposed to happen is um, the radius will be increasing for each minute. And when that happens, and this is where I should probably try another circle, but I don't trust myself. I'll do my best with the hand drawn. But after each minute, if the radius is increasing the same amount of distance, you end up getting a, a bigger circle. So what goes on is they're asking, well, if we know the rate that the radius is increasing, can we figure out the rate that the area is increasing? So um, I'm going to erase the others to kind of give us a, a reference. The first thing I'd like to do is see um, if I'm speaking about the radius and I'm talking about rate, that is the derivative of the radius with respect to time. There I am using the Leibniz notation. And right away, I can write, um, and I kind of keep fraction form if possible, I have the five centimeters per minute. Sometimes having the units attached definitely helps with some of the math and the problem. So again, they said rate, we needed the derivative. Uh, we, we actually know the derivative, we need to write it. Um, the other thing we wanna pay attention to is what do we want? So a lot of times you'll see me write a little note to myself, what do I want? And again, I'm seeing the words how fast. They don't quite say rate, but I'm, I'm assuming that's something with um, speaking about time. And they're talking about how fast is the area increasing? Well, this is where we need to kind of think about um, how can we relate um, some sort of algebra or trig or anything we know about circles to a function of the radius. So I think, well, this is where I pull up a lot of my formulas from my, my past math class, my related formula. Doesn't hurt to write it out. Um, we need to relate area and radius. Little notes to myself. And now you're kind of saying, oh, that's where they're getting the name, related. So relating area and radius. And we're gonna pull from our past. I know that we do have area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. And so that's going to be um, where we're kind of jumping off of. That's where the math is coming from. But before I jump into it, I need to understand what do I want? And again, when they say how fast is the area increasing, I believe we'd be taking the derivative of the area with respect to time. And we don't know what it is, but we wanna know when. So we might have to find the formula first. I, I don't like to plug in right away until I actually calculate derivatives with implicit differentiation. But I don't just want to know the formula for the rate of change with the area. I want to know once I have it, um, I want to know what size will it be or what is the rate when the radius is 10 centimeters. And let's, let's make this a little bit more clear when radius equals 10 centimeters. So again, we, we're understanding the problem as the radius gets larger, the area gets larger, but we're concerned about um, the rate that it's getting larger in terms of this. Uh, it's not about the size, so be careful. So we have our related formula, um, and maybe I'll center it just to give us some, I'll move it over just so that we can make it stand out. Area equals pi times r squared. Now, here's where the calculus comes in. We're gonna differentiate this. And differentiate just means take the derivative with respect 
through time. And so the best way I can do, I'm going to show the steps. Um, my notation for that is d over dt, and that would be me taking the derivative of the left side, and also the derivative with respect to time of the right side. It really helps to write out the steps at first so you really understand what's happening. So if we're taking the derivative of the area with respect to time, we would be rewriting this as dA dt. Now when we take the derivative of a constant, remember that pi is a little tricky, a constant times r squared, what we want to look at is that the derivative of a constant, the constant will get pulled out in the front a little faster. So we'd be looking at the derivative of r squared. But when we take the derivative of r squared, um, you can take it as normal if you'd like. There's no problem there. The derivative of r squared is 2r. But since r is a function of time, they've, they've defined it clearly for us, um, you are going to use the chain rule, kind of like what we did with the implicit differentiation. Because we did not have a straightforward t, we have to attach on the derivative of the inside. In this case, it's the derivative of r with respect to t. So that's a big deal. We want to be really careful about this. Um, using the chain rule, the idea from the implicit differentiation, it comes back a lot. And if you forget it, it causes some issues with being able to solve the problem later. So at this stage, just want to make sure we have clearly taken the derivative. This is where um, once we try to maybe clean it up a little bit, that might be useful. Yeah. A lot of times what we might see is we might see, well, uh, maybe that's nicer to say 2 pi times r uh, times dr dt, if that's helpful. Don't necessarily have to clean it up, but I always like to. Mathematician in me. So at this stage, um, if it's asking us to find the derivative of area with respect to time, how fast is the area increasing? We already have it solved for dA dt, but this is the case where we're going to now plug in what we know. So that we could actually get a, a value for this. So we know who R is if I can circle that. I think they, they told us um, r is equal to 10. Um, and if you'd like, um, I would maybe maybe keep the units uh, see, so that we can justify why we're ending with a certain type of unit. So I'll keep 10 centimeters. Then we also know dr dt. dr dt is the derivative of the radius with respect to time, or if we're saying it in plain English, um, the rate at which the radius is increasing in terms of time. So it is calculated at five centimeters per minute, or given to us as five centimeters per minute. Kind of using the unit so that we can see where we end up with. So now it becomes a matter of cleaning everything up. Um, a lot of times maybe you see the 10 times two times five, uh, so that might leave me with 100 pi. But now you can clearly see where the units are coming from. We see that we have centimeters times centimeters on top, so that's where we see the square centimeters. And then we still have minutes on the bottom. Um, if you are interested, uh, sometimes uh, people care about the approximation. Um, it kind of depends on the directions of the problem. If, if they don't specify, I usually like to leave it as exact. But this is where we would take uh, 100 and uh, multiply it by pi in our calculator. And remember, I'm just doing this off to the side. I don't think you guys need to see that. But I'm using the pi button. We're in calculus, so we're using the full approximation of pi. Don't use just 3.14. And so maybe we're going to get 314.15, uh, uh, I'll just say 9. Sometimes it tells us um, what to approximate. 
you know, do you take three decimal places? Do you take two decimal places? Um, but pay attention to the directions. So this is actually the first problem. Congratulations, you made it through your first related rate problem. And just to emphasize, um, once you set up what's given, understanding that when they mention something about rate or speed, that gives you an idea of the derivative. You always wanna make sure you're not plugging in actual numbers until you've actually completed the derivative step. So that's kind of about right here when I've taken the derivative and, and that clearly have shown um, the process. So be careful. We're gonna approach some more interesting problems. Uh, so you kind of get a little bit more experience. So moving on to example two, we have a six meter ladder propped up against the wall. And they wanna know if the bottom of the ladder is pulled away from the wall at a constant rate of 0 0.5 meters per second, how fast is the top of the ladder sliding when it reaches one meter from the ground? So anytime I have some sort of a visual given to me and it doesn't seem too complicated to draw, I like to write out a quick sketch so I can see what's going on. Um, so I know uh, a little bit of experience in life tells me, um, hopefully, that when you have a ladder propped up against the wall, usually the wall is at a 90 degree angle to the ground. So my six meter ladder, um, that is not changing as far as I know. Uh, they didn't say anything about the size of the ladder changing. So that my friends can be labeled as a clear concrete number. What they're telling us is that the bottom of the ladder is pulled away from the wall at a constant rate. So I see that rate coming back, constant rate. And if they're talking about the bottom of the ladder, they're taking this point and they're pulling it away from the wall. So away from the wall in this case would be moving to the right. And as you move that ladder, a few things happen. Um, you kind of notice that, let's say we move a little bit out to this direction. Uh, we see that the horizontal distance, the maybe we'll call this X, kind of convenient, horizontal represented by X. Um, the horizontal distance increases as you pull the ladder away from the wall. So you can keep drawing versions of your ladder. Of course, the more shallow your ladder is, the less useful I believe it would be. Kind of depends what you're using it for, but I assume you're climbing. So you could kind of see uh, the concept of what's going on. But as your ladder is getting pulled away from the wall, your vertical distance from which the ladder is, so I can see if I can start off, the vertical distance seems to be decreasing. It gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So um, if I want to represent vertical distance, I don't have to, but I like Y. And it appears that it is moving this way. So that should kind of also give us some sort of clue about signs uh, in a second or so. But We'll go with it. Let me erase the picture and make it uh, back to normal. Maybe there's some better animations that we can come up with to help with this. I'll, I'll look for some, uh, maybe some Desmos on this. Um, so let me see, I had, had this going on. I like to be a little more precise to see what's happening. And then I have my ladder, okay. Here we go. All right. Now, this is before, before I start doing anything, I like to name what is given for myself. And even if you're able to do this in your head um, in terms of getting credit for tests, um, this is really a nice thing to do uh, just in case you end up messing up along the way. At least we can see where uh, 
where you were going and we can try to give some partial credit. At least I hope. So let's look at this one more time. I always have to read it over again. If the bottom of the ladder is pulled away from the wall at a constant rate, there's that word rate again. So that's gonna tell me there's a derivative involved. And I just have to understand what I've labeled my picture as. It looks like the, the um, horizontal distance is, is represented as x. So this is where I would see dx, derivative of x with respect to time. That's where I'm getting the rate from. But they actually give me what that value is. It's uh, 0 0.5 meters per second. And let's make that a little nicer so we don't mess up later. Sometimes if my fives get confused with my s's, I have issues. Okay, so the next thing we have to say, is there anything else that they give us or ask us? Um, so I, I kind of read up on everything and stopped at meters per second. Now they want to know uh, from us how fast, uh-huh, how fast again. Again, that's keyword for some sort of rate. Rate ends up talking about derivatives. Um, so the how is usually what the want is. And so I'll kind of write it down over here this time. Um, how fast is the top of the ladder sliding when it reaches one meter from the ground? So because I'm looking for the how fast part, I'm looking for derivative of, and then the variable I kind of use to speak about the distance for the vertical movement, I use y. So that's derivative of y with respect to time. Um, and we actually don't know what it is yet. But we want to know when, when the, when the ladder reaches one meter from the ground. So when we speak about one meter from the ground, um, there's no derivative, but we need to understand, are we dealing with x's or y's? And when they speak one meter from the ground, as opposed to one meter away from the wall, um, I'm assuming that that is the y part, y equals one meter. So it does take a lot of time to think through these problems, but the more you spend uh, of the time uh, setting it up, once you get the math done, things tend to go a little bit more smoothly. So please be patient. So what we're gonna do right now, we're gonna reach into our math bag of tricks and we're gonna see if we can find a relationship that relates X and Y. So a lot of times we go through, like my, my mental list is, um, I have a trig ratio, maybe. Um, maybe there's similar triangles. Well, there's only one triangle, let's not do that one. Um, is there an area formula I can use? Well, they didn't wanna talk about area. Uh, and another like common one, um, I'm seeing Pythagorean theorem. So this is where I'm gonna say, okay, relationship, related formula. Related formula. And remember, we have to understand before we even pick the formula, we, we want to understand what variables are we trying to relate. Um, if we were trying to relate some sort of different aspect about this uh, drawing, we may choose a different version. So um, I believe I'll be able to kind of play with it, maybe example three or so. You'll see kind of a different spin on the problem. Um, so my related formula, uh, it's going to relate x and y. In our case, and it happens to be the Pythagorean theorem. That is um, our favorite, the right triangle, x squared plus y squared equals, well, a c squared. So in our case, the way our triangle is, uh, looks like our hypotenuse is 6. So 6 squared is 36. Now, what I'm interested in, I've got the formula, and it's in terms of different variables. So once you have the formula down, let's talk about the idea of what we're looking for. We are looking for derivative of y with respect to t. And because we're in this version, and after you've played with some of the implicit, differenti uh, let's see, was it dif implicit differentiation problems, I think that was 2.6, um, what we want to look at is, taking the derivative 
with respect to time of both of those sides. Change that notation for a second. There may be more than one way to play here, but I do like that sometimes implicit differentiation makes life a little bit easier. So I have a derivative of x squared plus y squared and derivative of 36. So as we're going through this, uh, when we're taking the derivative of a sum, just make sure we did not see any t variables in this particular problem. So when you take a derivative of a variable that you don't have respect to, is that the right way to say it? Ah, basically, as long as there's not a t, you have to use the chain rule and attach on the derivative of the inside function. So if I take the derivative of x squared, that's going to leave me with 2x, but because I do not have a t, I'm going to attach on dx dt, derivative of x with respect to time. There's the chain. We still have the sum. If I'm looking at the derivative of y squared, same reasoning, it's 2y, but we have to use the chain rule, taking the derivative of the inside, in this case, y is the inside. That's gonna lead us to attaching on derivative of y with respect to time. Now, moving over to the right side, derivative of a constant is zero, we are good to go. So at this case, now, we have the derivative of our related formula. Uh, it is a good idea to see if we can plug in what we know. So if we plug in what we know, I just go back to the top and I say, okay, um, I know dx dt is a number, 0 0.5 meters per second. And I also see that we've related, we have y actually going on. Um, but remember what we want, we actually are looking for dy dt. So if I'm having to solve this problem, um, I know that dx dt is going to turn into a number. y is going to turn into a number. dy dt is our variable in this sense. So my last issue is to try to understand um, x. I need to know the value for x. And so that's kind of something we have to play with. And we say, well, um, we actually know the relationship with x and y based on the idea of this particular formula. So um, this is where you kind of go back to the beginning and say, well, um, if you know y is one meter, um, we can find x. Now, I don't know when I'm starting that I'm going to have to find x. It all kind of comes back. It's, it's like promoted based on whatever I get when I take the derivative. So this is why it's really important when you're setting up these problems. If you write out given, you write out what you want, and you write out the when part, um, you could go back and think a little bit. It moves a little smoother because we're, we're making a video here. Um, but it does take some time. So please be patient with yourself. Um, let's go back. Remember that we have our, our um, x squared plus y squared equals 36 relationship. Um, so when y is equal to 1, we have x squared plus 1 squared uh, still equals 36. And then you end up solving for x. So we have uh, x squared plus 1 equals 36 x squared, uh, if you subtract one from both sides, we get x squared equals 35. And then when we take uh, the square root of both sides, I know technically we get the plus or minus square root of 35. But remember, this is a real life problem. So we would not be taking the negative case of the square root. We would be taking the positive case. So this is where we're getting x equals the square root of 35. And now, we know that value. So I'll separate this. Sometimes when you look at this one more time, you get confused. So I like to kind of make my separations. Let's plug in what we know. Okay, so two is already there. 
Now x is the square root of 35. And a lot of times it does help to use the units to promote or kind of work through what the end units will be. So units on x, x is a distance and it's in terms of meters. So that's where the m is coming from. Dx dt is 0 0.5 meters over seconds. I have the plus two. Uh, the y I also know is one meter. And it's the dy dt that I'm concerned about. I do not know what it is and it, it acts like my variable in this problem. Still equal to zero. So let's go through. Clean it up before you do anything else. It's a lot nicer that way. Um, the way I see it, I have 2 times square root of 35 times 0 0.5. Well, maybe I'll leave the square root of 35 in as I'm going through the problem. But 2 times 0.5 is 2 times 1 half, which is 1. So this is where I'm getting the square root of 35. And then also, uh, I'm looking at the units. Meters times meters, we have our meter square over second. Moving on, uh, two times one meter, just two meters, nothing special there, but we still have it multiplied by the derivative of y with respect to t and still equal to zero. So this is a point where now you want to just solve for your dy dt. That's the whole idea behind that. That's what we wanted, it's our variable. So if we do that, uh, what that means, I, I would move the square root of 35 square meters over seconds. We can do that, double check. Okay. So subtract it on both sides. Two meters derivative of y with respect to t. Uh, if I move that over, I'd have a minus in front of it. You could show the steps, but sometimes I kind of write it in a different color to help me remember. Square root of 35 over meter square over second. And I'm kind of avoiding uh, approximating the square root of 35 until the very end of the problem if needed. Uh, sometimes you, you, you approximate and you cut off too many decimals and then you run into issues where you're not as accurate. So be careful there. Um, the other thing I want to be careful about is understanding that m is not the variable, it is the units. So if it helps, you could write it in a different color. But again, I'm still solving for dy dt. So in order to do that, I'm dividing both sides by two meters. So you can show that if, if that's something that, that works for you. Dividing both sides by two meters, that finally isolates the dy dt to be equal to, still have that negative sign, um, but look what happens. We have the square root of 35 over two, and then check out what happens with the meters. Um, there's a meter square in the numerator versus meter square in the denominator, so they divide out. There's a meter on top, a second on the bottom in terms of units. So before I proceed, um, I, I, I feel like I've solved for dy dt, uh, but sometimes, I'll circle it, um, before you stop and wrap things up and, and move on to the next problem, always ask yourself, does the negative make sense? Sometimes um, we've been kind of warned about this. Oops, does negative make sense, not sense? Thank you. Remember, when you solve problems, it's not about just getting the answer, it's trying to interpret, did you solve it correctly? Did you answer what the problem asked for? Uh, and most of all, does it make sense with what you know? So we're gonna think about the situation one more time. Um, remember, dy dt was supposed to speak about um, the rate at which y was moving as x was moving. So if I'm gonna look at this, it appears that I'm seeing um, y is decreasing according to my picture. Just kind of check. 
sometimes it, it helps you when you reward it. Um, y is decreasing as x increases. So that negative sign, the idea of decreasing, the idea of the rate, um, the rate uh, decreasing, it's making the y shrink. That definitely makes sense. So yes, we feel good to go. Again, if you prefer uh, to approximate, uh, pay attention to directions of the problem. I did not specify about um, doing any rounding, so I like to leave it as the exact answer. Uh, if WebAssign asks differently, just kind of follow what decimal places they like you to round to. How are you feeling? So I know sometimes when you look at this and you come back, it looks a little intimidating, but we try to break it up into little pieces that we can actually do. Okay, so let's look at another version. Maybe it's not the same, the same problem. We have the angle of elevation of the sun is decreasing at a rate of 0 0.25 radians per hour. How fast is the shadow cast by a 400 foot tall building increasing when the angle of elevation to the sun is 30 degrees? I know you might not see that. It is a degree symbol. Now I've exaggerated it, but it is degrees. Okay, so um, I'm seeing angle of elevation. That word kind of brings back memories from trig class. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe there's something to do with trig. Usually when they talk about angle of elevation, they're usually speaking something about triangles. So drawing a picture of the situation definitely could help. Um, if I can talk about the angle of elevation of the sun is it decreasing. By a four, okay. Sorry, I had to think a little bit. Remember, like a lot of times when we go through these, um, we haven't seen these before, so we kind of have to pull our our previous knowledge. Um, I'm gonna look at the sun. Let's draw it. Well, maybe we don't have to be too crazy, but here I've got my little sun. And the angle of elevation of the sun, if you're speaking about angle of elevation, I, I believe you'd be looking at a triangle uh, to the sun. So maybe something like that. And when they speak about angle of elevation, ooh, angles. We're gonna have to bring back some thetas. That might be a good one. I mean, you could rename it, but a lot of times it's a little nicer to keep it in the, the form. I don't like to confuse angle measurements with X's and Y's. Okay, so angle of elevation to the sun is decreasing at a rate of 0 0.25 radians per hour. So when they talk about the angle decreasing, um, that is implying that this angle is getting smaller. And they want to know how fast is the shadow cast by a 400 foot tall building? So I believe we have our building. I mean, you can draw it more if you'd like to, but um, it's probably a little prettier in, in real life. But when I look at the fact that it's a 400 foot tall building, uh, building will never decrease in size. So we are okay to label it as 400 feet because they didn't say anything about when. So I want to kind of pay attention to you, okay. Uh, so the, the picture I set up uh, often brings to mind um, something about a right triangle again, just kind of knowing how relationships work. We're hoping building and the ground make a right angle. I know it's not always the case, but for the most part for it to stand, it should be. And the sun, the sun is setting, I believe. If the sun is setting, let's draw that. So it's moving down. The 
horizontal distance of the shadow, and let's think about shadows. Um, how do shadows work? Let's see. I can draw this in, in blue or something. Shadows should be on the ground. Yeah, I know, like a, you're right. They should be on the ground. Um, if you ever see your shadow that's not on the ground, I, I would run, uh, personally. Go ahead. Oh. No. She just wants to participate in our lesson. Okay. So, if the shadow, we're, we're speaking about the shadow, it's on the ground. Cool. Um, we know it's some sort of blob we see. I, I would talk about the distance of it um, as the sun is setting the shadow should be getting taller because more darkness comes around. So we're gonna work on this, let's see. Uh, maybe I can label this as well. So I've got my shadow. Or something like that in a sense. Okay, so I, I think I have a good idea of how the problem is working. Sun is setting. Um, when the sun sets, the angle of elevation decreases. And when the angle of elevation decreases, the shadow grows larger um, to the direction of the left, I guess, in terms of how we've drawn it. So I feel pretty good. I can move on. Um, let's talk about our givens. So with our givens, um, let's read this. Angle of elevation to the sun is decreasing at a Ah, here we go again, that rate, hence the name of the section, related rate. So it's decreasing at a rate. And so that would be, um, gonna, again, we use the angle, we use uh, theta. So d theta dt, um, if we are decreasing, that's another case where we know, okay, decreasing means subtract. And you know what it is? Yes, it means subtract. I told you. Not, not positive. It means subtract. Yes. Sorry, we had a little argument over here. But I'm telling you guys that decreasing does mean put a negative sign there. Okay, so what happens? Let's write out the number that's given, 0 0.25 radians per hour. And I like to write the units in. Okay, so I got to read a little further. How fast, oh, there we go again. How fast, how fast, there's that rate again. How fast is the shadow cast by a 400 foot tall building? Okay, let's do the want. That how kind of gives me the question. And how fast, um, the way I see it moving, it, we call that, that distance x. So this is where I'm getting dx dt. Um, we want to know what that is, but we want to know that when the angle of elevation to the sun is 30 degrees. So that would mean theta equals 30 degrees. And I think we're, we're pretty good because I don't see any other numbers in the problem. You see the 400 foot tall, but that is a constant uh, length. We can't do anything with that. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is that calculus and, and uh, degrees or degree symbols do not get along. Uh, usually when you do calculus, you are always kind of dealing with radians. So maybe before we jump into this and get confused, it might be better to convert right away. Uh, so if you guys remember, um, if we're going to write it in radians, theta equals a 30 degrees would be pi over 6. Be clear on those special angles. Okay, so that's in radians. Anytime I'm dealing with derivatives, yeah, radians. Okay, so the next thing we want to do um, I think we've got the given, we've got the want. This is where we're going to find a formula that relates. And then we look at our two variables in our sense. Our variables are theta and x.
So you kind of run through your list again. You say, okay, well, um, I see triangles and a lot of times triangles get me excited to use the Pythagorean theorem. Um, they didn't specify anything about area or they didn't talk about similar triangles here. Um, and I do see theta, which is like a big, big uh, red flag. I don't know if it's a red flag, but just a warning bell goes off in my mind that there's probably going to be trig in this. And yeah, um, we got to relate theta and x. And so if we kind of want to do that, um, I'm looking at theta, a relationship. I know, I know the opposite side. I know the um, adjacent side. This pulls me into tangent of theta. So tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. So that is, in our case, it's 400 feet over x. If you want to, I'm not sure, but sometimes I might put the units in small so that I can maybe deal with this later. We'll see. Okay, so, okay, it doesn't look really complicated. It's just that trig function we're going to have to play with. So once you have the formula relating the two variables or the three variables, wherever you lead to, now it's time to take the derivative. Um, that's where we're getting the rate part from. So we're going to differentiate both sides with respect to time using implicit differentiation. So we have derivative of tangent theta and derivative of 400 over x. Uh, maybe we'll keep the feet in. I'm not sure yet. And I know that I, uh, there's a formula, or, or I've memorized the derivative um, for derivative of tangent. Um, I know for sure that that is secant square theta. But I have to attach on, remember, it's a composition of functions. So if I attach on um, the chain part of this, or the link, I'm taking the derivative of the inside, d theta dt. And now maybe instead of looking at it as 400 over x, one of the tricks I like to use, seems like Leica is excited too. What do you think, Leica? What's that I heard? You think I should rewrite x as a negative exponent? I think you're right. Let's do that. Okay, so let me kind of erase this. And sometimes I don't know at the beginning, but I'll rewrite it. I'd like to rewrite it as 400 x to the negative one. That makes derivative taking a little nicer. Otherwise I have to play around with the quotient rule. So if I try to take the derivative of the right hand side, I can use the, the power rule. Um, I'm pulling the negative in front. Um, I'm pulling out the constant. Then you subtract one off the exponent. So negative one minus one gives me negative two. So that's like taking the derivative as normal. But remember, x is a function of time. So you have to attach on the chain link. So that's dx dt, chain rule. So at this stage, uh, if you can, clean it up a little bit. Uh, sometimes if I know I'm plugging in values, I don't like to see negative exponents. So maybe that's where you would see me, okay, secant square theta, d theta dt, um, negative 400. I might rewrite it so that the exponent is positive again. So I'm moving that x squared to the bottom. Still got my dx dt. And Make sure we're clear about that so we don't get confused. So now our job, um, this is probably where we're looking to see if we can plug in what we know. So what do we know? Uh, we do know d theta dt. So d theta dt, we can plug that right in right, in right away. Um, that is uh, negative 0 0.25. Um, I'll keep the units in. Um, sometimes you may find it a little bit more annoying, but 
Um, kind of big on this because it reminds me what I'm supposed to have at the end, but you can always think backwards and go with it that way. Um, I do want to look at secant square theta. Um, theta is not 30, theta is pi over 6. Uh, so I'm going to have to play around with uh, maybe the, the trig on this one a little bit more. I might have some side work. Um, in order to find secant square theta, uh, what I have to do, don't I have to take, find the secant of theta first and then square it? So that's what I have to kind of play with. Um, I'll write it down to remind me what I'm doing. So let's go with it this way. Theta is pi over 6. Okay, I'll do it this way. You guys have erasers, right? Um, we can actually plug in the theta right away, but I, I do have, I, I was just thinking ahead of time. I wanted to, I want to find that value. Sorry, I got too excited. Okay, so actually I have secant square of pi over 6, secant square theta. Uh, keeping in mind that that is going to be an actual number we're going to have to find. I'll do that in a second. Um, now I look at, uh, I have negative 400 still. Maybe I'm keeping the feet in there, maybe. Keep, keep that in there, maybe. And now I'm looking at x squared. So I, I think I, I have to figure out who x is. Um, because my whole job is to figure out who dx dt is. That's why I have to kind of really analyze this and saying, what am I really looking for? So I need to find x. Well, let me set it up for myself to remind myself. Um, that would be saying whatever the x is, I have to square it. And I still have this dx dt, and maybe I'll write it in red to make it stick out. You can highlight it, whatever works. But I, I need to do a little bit of trig to help me out with finding these values. So um, with the x value, I'm going to take this off to the side, kind of draw some organized scratch work. Um, for one thing, uh, the relationship between theta and x is 400. Tangent of theta is 400 over x, opposite over adjacent. So this is where I want to say, okay, well, I know that theta is pi over 6. So that's going to still leave me with uh, some value eventually, which will allow me to solve for x. Now, if you want to do a mini uh, 30, 60, 90 triangle on the side to help you remember what um, tangent of theta over 6 is, um, trig just comes back right away. Um, it could be useful. Remember with the 30, 60, 90 triangle? I know I'm using degrees, but that's kind of a little nicer. What is it? Uh, one uh, hypotenuse is two. We have a square root of three. And again, um, pi over six and 30 mean the same thing. So if I'm looking at uh, tangent of pi over six, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So that should be uh, one over square root of three. Don't worry too much about rationalizing. We're, we're elite now. A lot of times we can leave things in unsimplified form. I guess unless WebAssign yells at us, we'll see. So now we actually have a proportion that we could solve for x. So what I'm kind of seeing, you can do a little cross multiplication. Um, I can get x is equal to uh, 400 times square root of three cross multiplication. And I'm in feet, if that's still something we're, we're concerned about. So now I can take that x and I can plug that back in. Be patient on this. We're getting there. We can plug this back in. So um, I'll write it out. And then if you need to think about it on the side or write a little more scratch work, it's OK. Um, the more detailed you are and not skipping steps, the less likely you are to make a mistake. So we see that we have a 400 square root of 3 that we're going to write back in. 
with the little feet in there. And if we were to maybe simplify it out a little bit, um, what do we get? We can, we can do this in our mind, but I want to really show this so that we don't mess up here. We have feet on top. Uh, when you square 400, um, I already see a 400 on top, so I can say it's what, 400 square. When I square square root of three, I just get a three. When I square feet, I get feet squared or square feet. Okay, and I still have this dx dt going on. Not dx dx, dx dt. Okay, so let's clean this up a little bit. Um, you can kind of see, all right, the, the 400, one of them divides out. So I should get um, also the feet. One of the feet on top divides out with one of the feet on the bottom. I should get one over, oh, a negative. Don't worry about that. Negative. One over, let's see, 400 times three, 1,200. Take your time on this. If you miss something, it throws off the entire problem. That's what's kind of frustrating in WebAssign because you don't really know where you made the minor mistake. So just kind of keep at it. So I'm feeling pretty good about this. Um, let's now look. I know I be, I'm going to be able to find um, a number for secant square pi over 6. So let's go back. Another organized scratch work on the side. And I like to show my organized scratch work so then we know what's going on. Um, Remember, um, secant of theta is, from what I remember, let's kind of, let's do our quick little triangle. We should have hypotenuse always, hypotenuse over adjacent. That helps me remember. Because secant and cosine are related. So cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. Now, if I'm looking at secant of pi over 6, we'll do some, a little bit of adjusting. We draw your 30, 60, 90 triangle. Oh, are you, what is it, your pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 2 triangle? It doesn't ring that nicely in our ears when we say it that way, but we, we, the idea is we need to know the sides. So uh, the sides again, just kind of from our other triangle, one square root of three, a two as a hypotenuse. So if we're doing secant of pi over six, um, we should get a two, that's a hypotenuse first, and then the adjacent is the square root of three. And don't stress out about rationalizing. I know maybe your trig teacher really emphasized that, but a lot of times what we're looking at, we're gonna have to use this a little bit later, so maybe don't waste your time on the math at this point. So I have secant of pi over six, but I know that it's not just secant of pi over six I'm looking for, I'm looking for secant square, so I guess I'll write it in the problem if it helps. I know there's more than one way to go, but we are looking at it this way whenever we see this trig notation is that we end up having the square of the actual trig function secant of pi over six. Um, that may or may not help you, I don't know. You know, sometimes um, because I'm doing a video, it's a little bit nicer, I can slow down, you can fast forward if, if you already know this, so that's okay. So plugging in, yeah, I mean, maybe I'd show this off to the side. Um, that might be kind of nice to, to do just because it cleans it up a little bit. Secant square of pi over six is the same thing as squaring two over square root of three. So two squares is four, square root of three squared is three. That's a little bit nicer. Yeah, I prefer that way. So all I'm doing is replacing this whole statement with a little bit of the work I did. So that would give me four over three. Goodness. Takes a little bit of space here. Um, times negative 0.25. 
Remember, if we're talking about radians per hour, um, we could leave the per hour in there. Um, but radians don't need to be written because their units are, are not really there. But I don't mind. I'll write it in. Okay, we are very close. We have all the numbers in. We have just dx dt to find. Uh, so we could kind of clean it up a bit. Um, I might take my calculator, 4 thirds times 0.25. Um, uh, I know if um, I'm getting a 0.33333, but I know that's 1 third. So it might be cleaner uh, to just rewrite this as negative 1 third radians per hour. Still equals negative 1 over 1200 times dx dt, and I'll, I'll continue to write out the dx dt in red to remind myself that's what I have to find. Okay, I see that both sides are negative, so I know the negatives will divide out. Um, we can play around with a little bit of the math with um, some cross multiplying and dividing. Um, but the way I see it, um, we should have 1200 over 3 um, radians per hour is the same thing as dx dt. Yes, we got it. in there. And if it's possible, which I think it is, um, 1200 over 3 is really pretty. So I have um, I have 1200 over 3. Why am I pausing? That's the, the least of our worries. So that should give me 400 radians per hour. Oh, So this is what I want to make sure we're, we're clear about. So somewhere along the way, I dropped a unit because the reason I know, because I'm trying to understand if things make sense, let's double check. X was supposed to be representing the rate of the, the distance. And distances usually have some sort of thing like meters and feet. So I know at the end when I got radians per hour, something was a bit off. And so I kind of can go back backtrack that's why i write all my steps out and right about here um, i just forgot to rewrite it and yeah that happens just do your best sometimes you can even go back and think about it you don't necessarily have to re-edit re it but i have feet in the denominator so now if i play around with feet to the denominator when you do your cross multiplication you get radians times feet Radians times feet, but radians times feet. Remember, radian doesn't have any units, so most people don't even write it. That's where we're getting our feet per hour. And then that's why we have a better representation of the rate. The shadow. The shadow is moving at a rate of 400 feet per hour. And just kind of think, does that make sense with your problem? You know, just because I get an answer, I feel really good about myself, but um, before I can be really careful about circling it, I just go back and have to understand. Um, it's the signs that sometimes give me the issues. So uh, because I got a positive answer, that's telling me that the rate that the shadow is increasing is positive. And because the shadow is increasing, um, that goes along with making sense. So now I feel confident, a little more confident in, in finding my answer. Whew, that is a tough one. Um, I know uh, some of the math at first, not so bad, but some of the little plugging in stuff, that tends to be what gets the calculus uh, students. You guys know your calculus, it's usually like the little things. So just take your time, write out more work. Uh, it's okay, you're gonna be writing a lot more down. Uh, then, you know, when you get used to a lot of these things, you can skip steps, but I don't recommend it in your first calculus class. Just take your time. Okay. So normally, if this were a lecture class, we would stop and take a break. But um, since this is a lecture video and you can stop and take a break whenever you'd like by pressing pause, um, I would love to show you one more example uh, to kind of give you um, a little heads up of the kind of the different variations you may see. So I'm hoping with these four examples, this gives you enough um, 
what tools in your bag of tricks to kind of help you approach problems that are maybe worded slightly differently. So uh, I believe this is a homework problem in one of the sections. Maybe the numbers change, but I'd like to go over it if that's okay with you. And I'm just imagining you all nodding your heads yes and happy to move on. So yes, okay. Example four. Um, we've got ourselves a kite um, 100 feet above the ground moving horizontally at a speed of seven feet per second. So I really want to understand this. Um, so, okay. I know we don't necessarily get outside anymore, but uh, usually uh, back in the old days, maybe you can picture a movie, um, kites, um, those, you tend to see they're, they're diamond-like shaped little objects. And people used to um, tie string to them and it gets caught up in the wind and then it, it, get, it blows um, very, very high above. And once it gets caught up in the wind, it, it gets taller and taller and taller. It's pretty cool. But we have a kite. Look it up. Google it if you're not sure what we're talking about. Because, I mean, I don't think I've ever flown a kite in my life. I just know of it. You know, if I ever had that experience, I would have loved to fly a kite. Oh, well. Enough about me. Let's talk about the class. So here we go. Just kind of picturing. The kite is supposed to be moving um, at a horizontal distance. So we're in the sky. Um, what's going to happen along the way, um, I don't know which way it's moving yet, so right now I'll just kind of picture back and forth. I know technically it moves in one direction. I know, Laika. I got it. You want to fly a kite too, I guess. Okay. So, Let's think about this a little bit more. We gotta draw our situation before we can figure out what we want and what we need. So a kite 100 feet above the ground. Okay, I can, I can go with that. So let's 100 feet above the ground. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's gonna be a constant rate yet, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Um, it's moving horizontally. And they want to know at what uh, at a speed of seven feet per second. Okay. All right. So let's draw the ground. I hope you guys don't feel that you're suffering, but I always like to, to talk to you about my thoughts while I'm solving a problem. That way, you know, it's just not automatic. We think about these things first. So bear with me if you can. Okay, I draw my ground and we assume ground is level most of these problems. Okay, um, so at first, um, I guess they take a picture, it's like a snapshot, and they know that the kite is 100 feet above the ground. And then it's moving horizontally at a speed of seven feet per second, and they wanna know so let me, let me, let me add that in with the moving of the horizontal, um, that will be seven feet per second. The speed, aha, uh -huh, that gives me the idea that we're dealing with a derivative. Um, so I'll get that. Let's do this. Um, I think that can be labeled derivative, derivative of, well, horizontal movement, let's talk about x. See if that gives us anything, dx dt. And if it's moving at a speed of seven feet per second, it's positive, so let's make sure that equal sign does not look like a negative. I'll rewrite it for you all. Here we go. Okay, so that's gonna be seven, seven feet per second. Um, and so, okay, I think for sure I know I can write down that's given. dx dt equals positive seven feet per second. Cool. Okay, so they want to know at what rate is the angle in radians, thanks calculus, radians, between the string 
and the horizontal decreasing when 200 feet of string have been let out. All right, so let's think about this. Uh, remember we, we said they didn't specify what direction we were going? Okay, so I'm gonna erase this part now that we know what the, the dx dt is. So if the string has been let out, let's really analyze the string being let out means it's getting longer and longer. So here's the person's hand right here. I won't draw a hand, but snapshot in time, probably what's happening. We'll draw the little person, I guess, if we need to. Doesn't even look like a person. What am I trying to do? See, I get too caught up sometimes. Anyways, so the angle between the string and the horizontal, that I can kind of relate. Um, I'm seeing that that I can call that theta, the string and the horizontal. And they talk about that decreasing. So if that is decreasing, if you can try to picture this, um, if you, you, you can kind of draw a quick picture if you need to, but depending on the position of the kite, they said it's moving horizontally. Um, if you draw out the string and you draw a bunch of snapshots of kites along the way, or the same kite along the way, um, it appears that the string is going to get longer and longer and longer if you're moving or the kite is moving to the right. So now we can kind of know um, kind of the idea. And, and it makes sense because when they talked about the speed of seven feet per second, they didn't say it was negative. So that kind of tells me that the positive direction is to the right. So kind of look at that, analyze this a little bit. Maybe you saw this right away, but I just want to make you get used to kind of thinking about what's happening. So if I'm kind of playing around with how I want to deal with this, um, I could talk about the hypotenuse. It looks like that's going to be something that's happening. The, the string is going to get longer um, as we move. So I'm H for hypotenuse. And at the moment, the height, no matter what, assuming that the, it's only moving horizontally, the height is 100 feet, we can now start kind of labeling situations for our problems. So uh, the way I see it, I like to represent the verticals as uh, Y's, vertical distances. And then that would leave me with horizontal distances represented with an X. You can change the variables around, but I like to stay consistent. Okay, so, um, now rephrase. See how long it took us to analyze this. Um, if we go through this, let's kind of restate our givens. Um, we are given the um, rate at which the kite moves horizontally. We know it's moving to the right because we have a positive a seven feet per second. We are also given the distance from the kite to the ground because it's moving at a constant distance, a horizontal, I suppose. So we're also given that y equals 100 feet. So two things. Whoops. Okay. Cool. The next thing I want to talk about is what we want. Um, they're asking at what rate, there's that, that question, how or what, um, at what rate is the angle in radians. So rate, again, d over dt, but when you're talking about the rate of what? The rate of x, the rate of y, the rate of h, the rate of the angle, d theta dt. Let's make sure that theta looks like a theta. Don't want to get confused with zeros. And they're giving us a heads up of what's happening. Um, they're saying that it is decreasing. So I know it's gonna be negative. Um, so that's kind of a nice check for myself. I just don't know what it is yet. But they're trying to give us a heads up what's happening at that snapshot 
when the length of the string, so let's just assume the snapshot, the length of the string here, h is equal to 200 feet. That would be maybe one of these situations. So it's kind of taking a snapshot of different uh, positions along the way and, and, and doing the calculations as you go, hence related rates. Okay, we're ready. And this part moves a little bit faster when you've actually thought through the problem. We want a formula relating uh, theta and x. So if we have that, let's see. Um, see, whenever I come up with triangles, I, I really see, I see it's a right triangle. Um, I might, right away, you know, first thing, Pythagorean theorem. Um, well, that's great if they want to relate x, y, and h, but we want to relate theta and x. So usually that, that theta is a, is a big like red flag, ah, trig, trig's coming back. And if we're relating theta and x, we're relating an angle with an adjacent. And remember, the question is, should I relate the hypotenuse or should I relate the vertical distance, the opposite side? Um, always go with uh, what is remaining constant the entire way. Um, you'll notice that as you let the string out, or the, the kite moves more um, to the right as we're viewing it, or further away from the person flying the kite, the string keeps getting longer and longer. So that's changing. What is never changing is the distance from your kite to the ground in, in all of the senses. So I'm trying to highlight that. So that is why I would use something that would relate the theta with um, the adjacent um, and opposite. And look at that, tangent of theta. We love tangents, I guess, in calculus. So yeah, let's do it. We're almost there. So tangent of theta, in our case, is going to be opposite, that's 100 feet, over x. Um, you could play around if you feel like um, going through different trig functions, see what works best for you. Um, but before I do anything um, rash, uh, let's, let's maybe, maybe clean up. I, so, I mean, sometimes if you really want to write the units, it does help you along the way, but if you lose it, then I get it. I am eventually going to have to take the derivative. So there's, there's more than one way to play with this. Um, I could take the derivative of both sides, uh, kind of like what I did with the last example. Um, but I'd like to approach it a little differently just to give you kind of a spin on how, how things can be. Um, you know, if you know a little bit of algebra, you know a little bit of trig, you, you could approach this a little differently, have a different route, but still end up getting the same answer. So feel free to play. Um, what I'm going to do a little bit of algebra with you. Uh, I notice I have tangent of theta is 100 over x, so I can rewrite um, this statement by cross multiplying a little proportion. So I have x times tangent theta equals 100. I still got the feet. The other thing I can do and play with is that tangent of theta is never going to be zero. So we can divide both sides by tangent of theta. So at least that gives us x on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have 100 feet over tangent of theta. And now before I want to find any uh, derivatives or find implicit differentiation, I'm going to flex my, my trig muscles a little bit. And I'm going to rewrite tangent uh, so that it's not a fraction. It's not in the denominator anymore. So you guys remember that identity? one over tangent uh, can also be rewritten as da, 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 cotangent theta. So, I mean, it kind of makes it so that when I'm going through the math, I don't necessarily have to keep using power rule. 
if that's something you're interested in. If you hate this, it's okay. I won't even know. Uh, you could just kind of, you can play with some of the stuff we used over here on example three. But now I, I feel a little better, just a different version. I'm going to take the derivative with respect to time of both sides. And so here you kind of see, okay, well, if I'm trying to take the derivative of x with respect to t, derivative of x is 1, but we still end up with dx dt. So I'll keep it in red for now until I figure out which one we're, we're solving for again. I have to look back at the original problem a lot of times. Okay, so derivative of 100 times cotangent theta, 100 is a constant. We can pull that 100 out. And now we can play with what's the derivative of cotangent of theta. So if you did not know your derivatives, this would be where ah, I'm stuck. Uh, I'm going to change my mind. Maybe I'll try to use technique from, from example three. But um, we wanted you to get comfortable with those trig functions, especially when you prepare for calculus two. You're going to use those a lot more. Uh, so remind me. I don't even have Leica around here. She's not really helpful. But the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant square theta. Now, the other thing we have to remember is remember theta is a function of time. So we have to attach on the chain link, d theta dt, derivative of the inside. So um, we're feeling pretty good. I just want to say maybe, maybe now we can replace everything that we know um, what did they give us? dx dt? Yeah, they gave us dx dt. So we don't need to find that anymore. We can replace that. Um, let's replace that with a seven, seven feet per second. Positive. Okay. Seven feet per second. I guess I'm really big on the, the units. You see what I did? I dropped them off again. If it helps you, you put a little feet off to the side. Now, if I want to clean this up a little bit, what do we have? Um, 100 times a negative sign. We should have a negative 100. Let's keep that. Cool. And then now it's kind of your, your option. Uh, at this point, if you'd like, if you want to replace um, this whole cosecant square theta with its number, um, we're interested when uh, we actually have to find what this could be. So we don't know. They didn't give us theta, did they? Uh-uh. Look how fun this is. It's like a puzzle. And maybe it's frustrating at first, but once you, once you start understanding it, you get that aha moment, and then you feel a little good about yourself. It takes practice, though. Sometimes you run into dead ends, and you have to start over. But that's all about learning. I digress. OK. So let's talk about the cosecant of theta based on our triangle. So I still have this d theta dt. I'm going I'm to keep this in the, the position. Um, how do you say? Keep this in the picture. There we go. And I'm still going to attach on the feet just in case. Although I do see that they divide out on each side for a second. But anyways, here we have a right triangle. Um, I have a theta in general. Um, cosecant of theta. Is related to sine of theta. Sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So cosecant of theta is hypotenuse over opposite. And we're just kind of looking at what our situations are. Um, we had a vertical distance right away. We have the kite length at the snapshot in time to be 200 uh, feet. And then we don't know how far away the kite is uh, horizontally from us. So that's where the x comes into play. So if we kind of plug this into our thoughts, hypotenuse is uh, 200 feet. The opposite is 100 feet. So then what happens? The feet divide out. We end up getting cosecant of theta equals 200 divided by 100, 2.
Let's write that in. I pause. So notice you didn't really have to know theta. You just know a little bit of relationships going on. And you know what? I bet you guys are going to get so far and then you mess up at this point. That is typical in a calculus class. But don't beat yourself up about it. It's just, it's just a matter of details. So now, if we're trying to plug in cosecant of theta, uh, cosecant square of theta, this would be if you square both sides, then we should get cosecant square theta is four. So right away we can plug in the four. Finally, I know that takes a little thought, but it's really good exercise for your trig. So let's clean up just a little bit more. Um, notice that the units divided out because we are in radians, so there's no units left. You could say rad, rad, I guess, if you want, but let's work with it. I have seven feet per second. Um, if I clean this up just a little bit, I have negative 400 um, feet times d theta dt. And that's what we're supposed to find. So look at this this way. If you divide both sides by 400 feet, I'll do that in purple. And in fact, negative 400 feet in this sense. What happens is that the feet divide out in all cases. And we should be left with d theta dt all by itself on the right hand side. That's promising. And then on the left hand side, I'll re rephrase it. We have 7 over negative 400. And then we have seconds in the denominator. Now, does that make sense with the units? Um, maybe. Maybe I'll rewrite it. Sometimes we feel a little bit more confident when our variables on the left and our solutions on the right. Now remember, we're talking about the rate of change of the angle. So units on theta are technically radians. So yeah, it, it makes sense to not have a unit written on top. It, it's technically radians per second. Uh, the other issue would be, um, did we get what we thought we were gonna get? And again, it's kind of me analyzing the sign. I look at it a little more carefully. And when I was thinking about it earlier with my, my relationship, I was supposed to get a negative sign because the angle is supposed to be decreasing at a rate. So yeah. I'm feeling pretty good about this. Now, if you were inclined to, or maybe, maybe there was something going on where they wanted you to, I, I believe WebAssign was like really big on approximating, probably because it hates when you write fractions. I don't know. Uh, if you want to maybe approximate this, see if you get a, a, a not so crazy non-terminating decimal, you can kind of think about the um, decimal form of it. Sometimes that's um, maybe a little bit easier to picture that the, the angle is decreasing at a, a something smaller than one radian each second it goes. So, you know, test wise, quiz wise, either answer is great, but sometimes um, directions may, may, uh, may want you to rewrite it as a decimal. Maybe it's easier to enter it. Thanks for hanging out with me. I hope this is helpful. Remember, you want to try a lot of examples um, that we don't go over to get better at these. It takes some time, but give yourself, give yourself the time and be patient. I'll see you the next section.